Putting you on point, though. Nice.
Professor Kaiser and our dear guest, Dragi Prijatelj i kolege danas. Ja moram vam kažem, zavisno imam osobitu čast, mi se stvarno trudimo ovde da dovedemo u maticu zavisno najbolje od gosti u kojoj imamo prilike u Belgradu da sretnemo. I moram da kažem da mi je ovo stvarno veliko zadovoljstvo, jer smo godinu i po dana radili na tome da organizujemo ovu posetu. Znači, naš gost današnji neću pretarati ako kažem da je zaista među pet najatraktivnijih i najzanimljivijih naučnika u društvenim naukama i među istoričarima u Evropi danas. To je čovjek koji je ovo za početak, da kažem, njegov CV kad otvorite, on je na 31. stranici, dakle, sitno kucanih. Šta god da kažem od superlativa za njega, zaista neću pretarati. Neću širiti priču mnogo, danas predstavljamo ga kao čoveka koji je od 2000. godine predaje na poznatom univerzitetu u Portsmutu, gde predaje istoriju evropskih studija i evropske integracije. Ove godine će biti gostujući profesor na poznatom evropskom institutu u Firenci, živi u Dizadolfu, gde je njegova porodica i tako dalje. U svojoj bogatoj karijeri, on je rođen 1966. godine, dakle, radio je, ja moram da kažem da je prošao sva najznačajnija akademska mesta s jedne strane, ali s druge strane radio u Bundestagu, u Evropskoj komisiji, u raznim praktičnim stvarima koje su takođe vezane za evropske integracije. Dakle, o njemu stvarno bi mogli jedno tri dana da pričamo. Ja ću ovdje pomenuti, međutim, samo njegove najvažnije knjige. To je ono što je najvažnije, dakle, to je jedan zaista fascinantan opus danas. On je, kao što smo i stavili na nalazi, najveći ime za pitanja hrišćanske demokratije i Evrope i evropskih integracija posle drugog svjetskog rata iz one stvarne perspektive, a ne ove ideološke iz koje smo danas čuli. Ja ću samo navesti neke od njegovih najvažnijih i najznačajnijih ili zbornika ili knjige koje je uredio. Recimo, Christian Democracy and the Origins of European Union, dakle, hrišćanska demokratija i izvori ili poreklo Evropske unije iz 2007. to je monografija. Onda, recimo, sa prostorom šotom 2014. Writing Rules for Europe, dakle, pisati pravila za Evropu o normativizmu u razvoju evropskih integracija vezano za delovanje kartela, lobija i raznih drugih društvenih grupa. Onda je još jedan zanimljiv projekat Exhibit in Europe in Museums zajedno sa Krankenhagenom i profesor Kompers iz 2014. Vrlo zanimljivo praćenje toga kako se danas predstavlja istorija Evrope preko muzeja, kako se grade takozvani narativi, kako ko govori o svojoj prošlosti u Evropi. Zatim, recimo, knjiga o komparativne istorije proširenja Evropske unije, koja je 2014. godine, 2014. u četvrte godine sa profesorom Nove to objavio. Ono po čemu ga ja najviše znam i to su zaista klasične 
knjige, to je dva zbornika koja su se pojavila 2004. Jedan sa Helmutom Vonatom, politički katolicizam u Evropi između 1918. i 1945. I kao drugi tom ove produkcije, to je Christian Democracy in Europe since 1945. Dakle, hrišćanska demokratija u Evropi od 1945. zajedno sa Michael Gellerom. Te dve knjige zaista čine klasičan pregled ono što je hrišćanska demokratija ili razvoj političkog katolicizma, kako su oni rekli posle drugog svjetskog rata. Onda tu je, recimo, još par naslova i evo zoriću sa time kulturni ratovi, sekularno-katolički konflikt u 19-vekovnoj Evropi zajedno sa Kritoferom Tlakom u australijskim prostorom koji je nama poznatiji po knjizi Mesečari iz 2014. godine. I jedna knjiga koja je meni isto jako zanimljiva, nadam se da ću uspeti da je pročetam, to je Using Europe and Using the Europeans, Britain and European Integration od 1945-1943. da te upotreba Evropa i zloupotreba Evropila na neki način, Britanija i evropske integracije od 1945-1963. koje je obena 1997. godine. O tome njegovom opusu u ređivanju različitih temata u časopisima mogla bi tri dana da se priča. Ja ne bih više oduzimao vremena i zaista bih ga zamogao danas da nam iznose jednu od tema na kojima radi i koja je vezana za ova njegove istraživanja uloge hrišćanske demokratije u evropskim integracijama posle druga svjetskoj rata. I have tried to briefly present your basic of your work. Anyway, thank you very much and please the floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much for inviting me to this prestigious and beautiful institution. It's the first time for me to be in Novi Sad, so I'm really pleased and happy to be here and to be able to speak to you. As you will uh, know from the fact that the title of my lecture is in English. Unfortunately, I'm not uh, capable of speaking or understanding Serbian, although I did understand a few things uh, that you did say, but they were mostly the English titles of my books. <laughs> Thank you very much for the very kind uh, introduction. I'm sure that the praise was exaggerated, <laughs> but I'm grateful for that. So what I'm going to talk about today... Yeah. Well, thank you for that. And as I think you probably already explained, uh, you have kindly prepared a translation of my lecture, so I will actually stick to the text of my lecture because otherwise we would have problems. But then hopefully also we will have an interesting perhaps question and answer session afterwards and we will be able to um, clarify some points or dis discuss some points further. Is the European Union conceived as an attempt to create a highly institutionalized form of transnational democracy about to implode? Its enemies are certainly hopeful, if not already jubilant. Sympathetic observers are also increasingly mindful that the European Union could indeed come apart. Thus, in a recent article for the left liberal Guardian newspaper in the United Kingdom, George Soros, the Hungarian-born American philanthropist, warned that European leaders appeared to issue statements and pass regulations doing business as usual, this at a time when no one was listening to them anymore. In fact, Soros argued provocatively, the European Union at the start of 2019 reminded him of the Soviet Union when it entered its irreversible process of disintegration after the end of the Cold War. Soros is, of course, a great supporter of European integration in the EU. His contribution to the debate was intended as a kind of wake-up call to Europeans to stem the tide of nationalism, a tide that seemed to be swelling in advance of the elections to the European Parliament that took place last Sunday, yesterday, or on Thursday in the United Kingdom. Soros was especially critical of traditionally pro-European transnational political groups like the European People's Party as a center-right political formation. He alleged that it had sold its European soul to accommodate the likes of the Hungarian Prime Minister Orban and his Fidesz party, and all of this just to secure positions of power in the European Parliament and the wider European Union. Douglas Murray, a Scottish author, recently published a book about his travels across Europe and conversations with ordinary Europeans. 
we Europeans, he concluded, are in the process of committing collective suicide, sacrificing some 70 years, and of course in this sense he was only talking about Western Europe, sacrificing some 70 years of peace and prosperity in Western Europe. Paraphrasing the title of the Australian historian Christopher Clark's book about the outbreak of the First World War, he believes that we Europeans are sleepwalking into unpredictable chaos, chaos that could take the shape of anything from economic protectionism to outbursts of extreme nationalism and violence and the collapse of our institutions in the European Union and its member states. Or, for that matter, war in one form or another. In fact, the German conservative national daily newspaper Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung recently asked only half-jokingly, exempting the Balkans for obvious reasons, have we had no war for too long already? In Western Europe, we may still find it difficult to imagine shooting at each other again. However, the phenomenal Brexit chaos in the disunited kingdom tells us that war rhetoric in Europe has at least reached new heights, or should I say depth of dangerous stupidity. As you may recall, many moons ago, David Cameron, then Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, promised to call a referendum about an apparently easy question, to be in or to be out. This with the only objective to remain Conservative Party leader and Prime Minister. Similarly, his successor's only objective was to keep her party together and remain Prime Minister, whatever the impact of whatever Brexit on the lives of the British people. European democracy is clearly in a state of acute crisis once again. Many European citizens feel that the people, however ill-defined, no longer rule, and they see traditional elites as a bunch of self-serving technocrats without a vision or ability to act decisively. The European Union, as an attempted transnational incarnation of democracy in an age of globalization, has come under especially sharp attack from both the left and the right, who are using more and more vitriolic anti-European nationalist rhetoric, perturbing to defend national democracy. Italy is at the forefront of this movement. Only those who have grown up in the collective amnesia about Mussolini in this country after 1945 would fail to recognize the decidedly fascist style and rhetoric of Matteo Salvini from the Lega, who seems to spend more time denouncing other European political leaders or countries than addressing Italy's grave domestic problems, and who almost rivals Trump in working closely with dictators like Putin. In these disturbing contemporary circumstances, I would like to discuss in my lecture what I consider to be the three main strands of visions and practices of governing or ruling Europe, which have a shaped attempts at creating a transnational democracy of sorts in Western Europe after 1945, all of which, of course, have long-term roots before the First World War. It seems to me that understanding these strands and resulting trajectories is especially important if we want to overcome the continuing West-East divide in Europe over these experiences and related memories. The three strands are first, the struggle for what I call executive autonomy, which was deeply embedded in one uh, my Dutch co-author, Johan Schott, and I in our 2014 book, which Misha just mentioned in his introduction, writing the rules for Europe, have called technocratic internationalism. A tradition of practicing governance beyond the nation state that also strongly influenced the thinking of Jean Monnet about European integration when he drafted the 1950 Schumann plan that led to the creation of the European Coal and Steel Community, and that was in turn influenced by him. Second, practices of neo-corporatist cooperation and consensus seeking that dominated transnational industry cooperation as well as industrial relations in many European countries for a very long time. Practices that have also shaped institutional politics in what is now the European Union. And third, the vision to Europeanize parliamentary democracy by constitutionalizing what is now the European Union or turning it into a parliamentary system, more or less like any other as they had developed in Europe since the 19th century. We'll discuss these three visions and practices in turn. And in conclusion, I aim to show how each one of them has impacted on attempts to create a transnational European democracy and how they might in fact have contributed to the far more aggressive contestation of European Union. Union here spelled with a small u, 
At a time when contemporary vitriolic attacks on the European Union with a capital U as an organization increasingly only serve as a smokescreen for opposition to almost any form of structured cooperation in Europe. By the time of the creation of the European Coal and Steel Community in the early 1950s, technocratic internationalism had created a long-term trajectory for international practices. This trajectory strongly influenced Jean Monnet, who was the first head of the high authority of the European Coal and Steel Community. Following his own initiative to set up technocratic Franco-British bodies in London to coordinate the Allied effort in the First World War, Monet represented France on many of them, including the Allied Maritime Transport Council, Council created in 1917, which divided up Allied shipping tonnage to shorten the war. Monet's experience in London during the war had major repercussions for his thinking about European cooperation. His objective was never a particular institutional form, supranational or otherwise, but to achieve the highest possible degree of autonomy for effective informal and what he thought of as rational cooperation. Reflecting on Allied collaboration in the BBC interview televised in 1971, he recollected that the French trade minister with whom he worked closely during the First World War always thought, I quote, in terms of a document, of a finished product. I didn't think in terms of a finished product because there is no such thing, unquote. Characteristically, in a memorandum for the Paris Peace Conference in 1919, Monet highlighted the need for a setup for the future League of Nations, which would allow the anal analysis of an issue, uh, I quote, in its entirety, and not based on the, I quote, immediate interests of states and governments. Monet's preference for depoliticizing issues to facilitate their rational analysis and solution also informed his subsequent work as Deputy Secretary General of the League of Nations between 1919 and 1923. Thus, in 1921, he proposed to Eric Drummond, the Secretary General of the League of Nations, to delegate intricate and highly contested territorial issues like the future of the Saar region or of Danzig to technical commissions with sufficient independence to propose and implement solutions. Unlike Monet, however, Drummond strongly believed that the governments in the Council had to take direct responsibility for these issues and mediate between the countries concerned. Although Monet disagreed with Clément Tales, the trade minister's strong emphasis on the need for formalization and institutionalization, he largely shared the French trade minister's preference for new forms of economic policy and planning as a second lesson learned from the First World War experience. The war effort induced new forms of domestic state intervention and planning, as well as allied cooperation. Monet favored such, in the French political context, radical socialist solutions. He supported Clémentel in his proposal to the Paris Peace Conference for a new European economic order. This order would have allowed the continuation of at least some of the wartime governance institutions and practices, but it was rejected by the Allied governments in April 1919. Allied cooperation in the First World War was fraught with difficulties from the start, however, an experience that made Monet more determined to seek greater autonomy and independence for executive governance in the future. To begin with, the French and British governments entered into the more intensified cooperation only under the extreme pressure of external shocks such as the disastrous harvest in 1916 and the renewed unlimited submarine warfare declared by the German Reich on the 31st of January 1917. Even when this intensified cooperation was agreed, it was still overshadowed by strong bureaucratic and national rivalries, which severely complicated the work Monet of Monet and his colleagues. To begin with, the British could rely on their huge empire and merchant fleet for the provision of goods. As a result, they were in a much stronger bargaining position than the French. In line with British public opinion, the British government was very reluctant to concede equality to France in any bilateral cooperation. Both governments also played diplomatic games over their respective demands for the allocation of food and tonnage, which made it hard for Monet and his collaborators to operationalize the generic common interest in winning and shortening the war. Despite these cumbersome difficulties, cooperating with other nationals in the shipping commissariat, as it was jokingly called in 1917, was a unique experience for Monet. 
It showed him both the opportunities and limits of executive governance as constrained by the formerly more intergovernmental institutional setup and governments aggressively pursuing their interests. During the 10 years he spent in the United States from the mid-1930s uh, onwards, moreover, he observed with great interest New Deal policies. His exposure to New Deal policies also explains why he reacted favorably when Paul Reuter suggested the English term authority for use in the Schumann plan after 1945. The preferences of Monet as a generalist decision maker for autonomous executive governance in European cooperation were not unique, however. Instead, they were embedded in a strong tradition of technocratic internationalism, which had its roots in the 19th century. This tradition created a crucial tra trajectory into the Western Europe of the 1950s. Monet's cooperation preferences and practices had already characterized much of the work of transnational voluntary and international organizations in the 19th century. Experts who worked in and for organizations like the International Telegraph Union or the Universal Postal Union, for example, largely shared three key assumptions about how best to tackle such transnational issues. First and foremost, informed by the growth of technology and science and the experience of industrialization and its social consequences, they advocated scientifically informed policy making by themselves within agreed parameters of evolving knowledge about the issues at stake. Secondly, these experts also believed that depoliticizing issues through rational deliberation in committees would allow consensual agreement on optimal policy solutions. In their view, diplomats were trained to treat international negotiations as what political scientists call zero-sum games, in which one state gains at the expense of another. In contrast, they were working towards what Monet called the common interest. As a result, they thirdly sought to create the greatest possible space for policy deliberation and decision making for themselves and to limit the influence of foreign ministries, a notion that was to become influential in post-war West European integration. As president of the Schumann Plan Conference, Monet claimed that three essential points would transform Western Europe after 1945. One of them was what he now called the supranational character of the future community. Even at this point, however, Monet conceived of supranational integration primarily as the common practice of overcoming national or purely national viewpoints. In the meeting of the Consultative Committee in 19, April 1953, for example, he explained that the member state governments in the Council naturally represented an aggregated national interest. In contrast, the high authority would defend what it thought was in the European interest. Actually, Monet told the members of the tripartite consultative committee, which had no decision-making functions at all, that it too was such a supranational institution. As a result, it should strictly avoid drawing on the support of biased experts from national companies, associations, and trade unions for their deliberations. Such consultation already entailed the danger of mixing the interests of the community and those of individual social groups. Monet justified his chaotic working methods at the helm of the high authority with the need, I quote, to teach my staff to think along European instead of national lines, unquote. In February 1953, he claimed that he would only need four months for this task. Then, I quote, a basic transformation of European life and history will have been effected. Quite ambitious, you would say. Many high authority officials disagreed at least with aspects of Monet's grand vision, yet they mostly shared his preference for direct communication and cooperation between the high authority as an international executive institution and national ministries. In the case of the European communities, policy making contacts as a rule were between the high authority and the commission in the, what is now the European Union, and the responsible national ministries with foreign ministries retaining more of a supervisory role only. Now coming to the second um, section or second vector that I'm talking about, neo-corporatist forms of cooperation. The second governance vision and practice derived from transnational business cooperation and spilled over into national and European level cons consultation and consensus seeking between state institutions and societal groups. Transnational cartel practices characterized the European coal and steel industry since the late 19th century already. 
cartels favored informal over formalized cooperation and sought to maximize industry influence and minimize what companies regarded as interference by governments. As reflected in the initial skepticism of steel companies towards the Schumann plan, this tradition set uneasily with Monet's attempt to build a new kind of formal institution with the higher authority with strong legal powers. However, both were connected through the shared belief in autonomy and rational decision-making by experts. In interwar Europe, advocates of cartels increasingly sought to legitimize them as more than just economic policy tools for avoiding what they called wasteful competition. Thus, Arthur Salter, Monet's close collaborator in the shipping commissariat in the First World War, who headed the League's economic and financial section from 1920 to 1931, argued in a 1932 book that cartels are, quote, cut across national frontiers and help to eliminate them as factors of the world's economic life and competitive struggle. They thus create interests and forces which still tend to counteract the competitive nationalism which is the world's chief danger, unquote. Moreover, cartels could draw upon informal international machineries with small secretariats usually linked to company headquarters, which also, like cooperation in expert committees, avoided intrusion by diplomats. The political rationalization of transnational cartels as, foresee, uh, as forces sorry, for peace also influenced the cartel debate in the League of Nations during the 1927 World Economic Conference and its aftermath. The main conflict line in the conference's industrial committee separated representatives of private companies and business associations who were broadly supportive of cartels and experts from the International Labour Organization, trade unions and consumer groups who highlighted their dangers and demanded some form of national and international regulation. The claim that transnational cartels could even foster international understanding and peace actually appeared to be borne out by the International Steel Cartel, initiated by the German steel mag magnate uh, Fritz, Th Fritz Thyssen and Emil Meirisch from Arbet, the Saar company, Saar-based steel company, who also worked towards Franco-German reconciliation in the Franco-German Information and Documentation Committee set up in 1926. In this case, transnational business and European political cooperation appeared to go hand in hand. At the more practical level of managing coal and steel markets, an entire generation of decision makers in the industry became socialized into transnational cartels as the appropriate approach to governing the sector. Moreover, in Western Europe, this notion survived the Second World War. During the war, traditional business links, friendships, and family ties buttressed networks and established patterns of cooperation. By the end of the war, as John Gillingham has observed, I quote, conflicts of interest, management breakdowns, and different national loyalties, unquote, had failed to undermine the tradition of cooperation in the West European heavy industry. Unlike Salter, Monet viewed cartels critically and facilitated the inclusion of anti-cartel articles into the coal and steel community treaty. He also managed to avoid the appointment of obvious industry lobbyists as members of the high authority. Heavy industry influence at national level was far more pervasive, however. Moreover, the steel industry secured transnational influence on, co on the coal and steel community policy making in two important ways. First, it largely controlled the hiring of industry experts for key high authority departments. Secondly, industry consultation was very close also in the consultative committee. Although it had mixed membership, including representatives from the trade unions and steel consuming industries, the steel industry delegates had closer networks, enjoyed long gun mandates, and were able to dominate the institution. The committee had consultative rights on paper only. In reality, relations not only between national governments, but also the high authority and steel producing interests were very close. When he took part in meetings of the Consultative Committee, Monet regularly highlighted that its members were appointed in a personal capacity, that they should never adopt a national viewpoint, and that the high authority was interested in their knowledge and ideas, and that as a result, they should not bother with internal regulations or voting procedures, but keep their work and cooperation with the high authority officials as informal as possible. 
Contrary to Monet's preferences, however, the consultative committee quickly began to involve experts from companies, national associations, and trade unions. It also adopted elaborate internal regulations and voting procedures and practices. Moreover, the high authorities' links with business interests were so close that it effectively delegated some decision-making to the consultative committee. This concerned, for example, the allocation of European co-funding for research. The cooperative cartel tradition, therefore, became embedded in European governance through the high authority staff policy, with hiring of industry experts effectively controlled by coalescing national governments and industry associations, as well as through industry influence via the national route and the consultative committee. Far from implementing a more forceful competition policy, the high authority actually fostered the reconcentration of the German and European steel industry. The institution's economic growth ideology of achieving productivity gains through concerted action in practice actually required close collaboration with the industry, which Monet had initially sought to avoid. The high authority also made no effort to stamp out the cartel tradition more thoroughly. From the 1960s onwards, order liberal notions of competition slowly gained ground in the European community. But as Laurent Valosé and others have shown, it took a very long time for them to have any impact on policy making and legal decision making in the 1970s and 1980s. Now, now coming to the of transnational democracy, transnational governance, constitutionalizing European integration. Not just Charles de Gaulle, from his particular nationalist perspective, criticized European technocracy. In April 1960, for example, Hans Fohler, the German president of the European Parliament, warned, warned against overbearing bureaucracies that could develop technocratic lives of their own. For him and many others, European integration had to develop a political system with a European Parliament with full budgetary and legislative powers that would also control a European government's government of states. This view amounted to the third vision and practice in post-war Europe, towards the Europeanization of parliamentary democracy by constitutionalizing what is now the European Union. This broadly federalist agenda had many fathers, of course, including, for example, Belgian and Italian socialists like Altiero Spinelli. However, Christian Democrats, their transnational party organization, and their group in the European Parliament played a particularly crucial role in what political scientists have called the system building of institutionally deep European integration. In the early post-war period, the continental Western European Christian Democrats strongly supported forms of core Europe integration. Regarding its most desirable institutional setup, however, some were pragmatic and others supported federalist solutions. In discussions in the informal Geneva Circle in December 1948, for example, some participants agreed with Georges Bidot, uh, at that time French Foreign Minister, that results are more important than their legal form. Earlier in the same year, however, Francois de Monton, another leading French Christian Democrat, had prepared the first draft constitution for the United Europe following the European Movement's Congress at The Hague. In September 1948, the newly set up and loosely structured organization of Christian Democratic Party cooperation, called the Nouvelles Équipes Internationales, passed a political resolution at its Congress in The Hague. It envisaged a bicameral system as a long-term institutional solution for an integrated Europe. This system would have a directly elected chamber of deputies and a second chamber of member state representatives. Once the Kohl and Steel community became operational, the Christian Democrats took a pragmatic approach to institutional issues at the intergovernmental level between the states and governments. During the 1960s, they had no other choice because of the Gould's preferences. If they wanted to maintain the communities, implement the policies already foreseen in the treaty, and secure their legal integrity. While making pragmatic concessions in the Luxembourg Compromise of January 1966 about an informal national veto. At the same time, the Christian Democratic Group upheld the constitutionalization paradigm. Not only was Article 38 for European political community inserted in the European Defense Community Treaty on the initiative of Alcide de Gasperi, Christian Democrats subsequently also dominated the proceedings of the ad hoc assembly that drafted the European Political Community Treaty during 1952-53. This not just in terms of 
political agenda of this committee. After the failure of these two treaties, the Christian Democrat group was also at the forefront of efforts in the Common Assembly of the Coal and Steel Community to push for some form of relaunch of European integration, as it was frequently called at the time. As rapporteur in the Political Affairs Committee, the Dutch member Margareta Klompe reminded her fellow group members, I quote, we must never forget we are a political institution and not an assembly of technocrats. The group of the European People's Party, or EPP, as it was called after 1976, and is still called that, and is still the largest group in the European Parliament after the elections yesterday, continued to play the role of a federalist engine. The group's Italian chairman in the Political Affairs Committee during the period of no formal institutional reform until 1970 pushed the reform agenda strongly. The EPP group advocated European-level parliamentarization as the key component of what the Belgian member Alfred Bertrand in the mid-1970s termed the strategy for the European community's fundamental democratization. The Christian Democrat group, the Political Affairs Committee in the Parliament and the European Parliament as a whole, focused first of all on making proposals on how to implement the treaty provision for the Parliament's eventual direct elections. The EPP group thereafter continued to advocate constitutionalization during the debate about European Union in the 1970s. Once the Parliament was directly elected for the first time in 1979, the EPP group immediately set out to discuss institutional reform in the Political Affairs Committee, institu Committee's Institutional Subcommittee. After its publication of several inconsequential reports, however, Spinelli claimed in the plenary that, I quote, the community is practically paralyzed. He took the initiative and set up the cross-party cro so-called Crocodile Club to bring about fundamental constitutional change through creating an ad hoc committee to prepare a draft constitution to be ratified by the parliaments of the member states. The Crocodile Club initiative posed a serious challenge for the EPP group in a number of ways. Ideologically, as one of the founding fathers of European federalism, Spinelli, who had broken with Stalinism in the 1930s, largely shared the EPP group's programmatic preference, preference for constitutionalizing the community. Nevertheless, although not a party member, he had been elected on the list of the Italian Euro-Communists. This, in turn, made it much harder for the Christian Democrats to sell cross-party cooperation with him to their staunchly anti-communist members in countries like West Germany. Politically, Spinelli's initiative also threatened to undermine the EPP group's standalone identity in the parliament as the strongest promoter of deepening European integration since 1945. Thus, even when the group agreed to make a full contribution to the work of the newly constituted Institutional Affairs Committee charged with drafting a constitution, it remained concerned about its own identity and visibility in this process. Although the final version of the 1984 draft treaty on European Union marked a constitutional compromise and was never actually ratified, the process leading up to the vote on it nevertheless played a crucial role. First, in sustaining the EPP group's leadership role on institutional deepening. Second, in facilitating cross-party consensus on the need for endowing the parliament with substantial powers and for overcoming blockages in the council by stopping the unanimity practice. And third, creating a repertoire of constitutional ideas which the groups in the parliament, national parties and governments could later draw upon for institutional reform. Thus, the European Christian Democrats and the EPP group in particular played a leading role in creating and consolidating a strong trajectory for the constitutionalization of the present-day European Union. So far, I've tried to sketch what I call three vectors of visions and practices of governing Europe, which strongly influenced post-war European integration. Did those who promoted these disparate visions and practices all seek to create transnational democracy? To begin with, that is only true to a limited extent. Monet, for example, was primarily interested in what the German Chancellor Helmut Kohl later described as what comes out at the back or the result of a European-level policy and decision-making process which had to emerge from the pooled knowledge of independent generalists and experts in a European executive and their definition of what was in the common interest of all. 
Did Monet give much thought to the quality of democracy at the new European governance level? Most certainly not. In fact, his original plan did not even include a provision for a parliamentary assembly. The same was true for European business groups and trade unions. For them, European integration fulfilled a variety of functions such as facilitating growth, enhancing the competitiveness of European business, reducing prices for consumer goods, or containing the communist temptation in countries like France and Italy. This in addition to these groups' broader interest in peace and stability and so on. These organized societal groups were generally happy with the evolving consensus-oriented practices in the communities. These largely replicated what they knew from their domestic political systems and practices. In Europe, moreover, consensus-oriented policy-making practices seemed essential so shortly after the end of the Second World War. At the time, pluralist competition, where some interests might entirely prevail over other interests, would have been seen by these societal groups as a danger for reconciliation and institutionalized cooperation. Even many among those who advocated some form of federal union did not give much thought to essential or desirable qualities of transnational democracy. They often habitually transposed their domestic experience with parliamentary democracy to the new European level. Strengthening parliamentary power by itself would remedy any democratic deficit as it came to be known from the 1970s onwards, or so it seemed or they partly acted out of institutional self-interest. As I've recently shown in my study of the European Parliament's role in pushing for institutional deepening during the period from 1979 to 1989, the directly elected members of Parliament simply wanted something useful to do and to have a proper say in decision-making. What legacies have the three vectors that I have sketched had and how have they impacted on European integration and future prospects of transnational democracy. To begin with, the drive for executive autonomy certainly had a lasting impact on the institutional identity of the European Commission. The Commission collectively has traditionally believed in the notion that it, and only it, knows what is in the common European interest, or in the interest of all. Its institutional behavior has traditionally had a strong anti-pluralistic streak as a result. The overriding objective is, from this perspective, to identify the best policy option and then to gain the support of the Council and, these days, the Parliament for it. In contrast, the Commission has always regarded the drive towards what political scientists have called input legitimacy through the wide involvement of societal interest and citizens in policy making with great skepticism although it might have paid lip service to it. For it, output has always bumped input. This approach fitted perfectly with the post-war modernization paradigm and the widespread belief in technocratic policy making. To be fair, many citizens did not expect much more from democracy than casting their vote at the ballot box every four years or so, as long as their welfare appeared to grow continuously during the Trente Glorieuse or nearly 30 years of uninterrupted growth in Western Europe until 1973. In times when many citizens demand greater involvement in politics nowadays, which is much more challenging at transnational European level, and politics is becoming more political once more, the European Commission has become an easy target for criticism. Criticism that, in essence, the goal already leveled against it nearly 60 years ago of its technocratic approach of depoliticizing politics, following Monet, and its lack of popular legitimacy. Organized and informal cooperation among societal actors in European integration and with the supranational institutions and national governments has added a second legacy consensus-driven politics, which largely still characterizes the policy-making pattern of the European Union, especially in the Council. Consensus-seeking was mostly seen as essential and desirable in the early post-war period. However, the necessarily complex processes of decision-making in the European Union are now criticized for lacking transparency. Moreover, populist leaders require not intelligent compromises, giving something to everyone to stabilize cooperation. 
policy trajectories. Instead, they foster polarized polit politics of us against them, where you either win, apparently confirming your leadership, or you lose, confirming that you are collectively the victim of a Brussels conspiracy, something that in turn promises to shore up nationalist feelings that these politicians fuel deliberately. Paradoxically, par paradoxically, such narratives of victimhood appear to be electorally successful, especially in countries like Italy, where the political elites for 60 years told the story that all of the country's diseases would in fact be cured by Brussels, externalizing political responsibility for all domestic political problems from corruption to tax evasion, a ludicrously inefficient administration, administration and an unsustainable welfare system that has protected those who have against the have-nots. These are hopes that political elites in southeastern Europe, possibly also in Serbia, also appear to invest in future EU membership, but could eventually backfire on them when it turns out that the EU does not provide comprehensive vaccination against domestic political failure. Even the Federalist vision left a lasting problematic legacy. Its constitutionalization paradigm assumed that the United States of Europe of one kind or another would have a powerful parliament and a government that depended on its support and that this would create sufficient legitimacy. In the 1970s, advocates of some form of federal union in fact talked up the notion that the communities were suffering from a democratic deficit because of the lack of full parliamentary powers at this new supranational level. In this way, they actually reinforced the democratic deficit narrative that stuck in the minds of the Federalists, of course, fostered the democratic deficit narrative to gain the power of the parliament, and with some success. However, many citizens already believed in the 1980s that the parliament had powers, and that it was to be blamed alongside other institutions for the ineffectiveness of politics and policymaking. The parliament thus, I would argue, trapped itself in the democratic deficit narrative too. Arguably, moreover, moreover the deficit, inasmuch as it did exist, also encompassed the insufficient national level parliamentary control of executive policy making by the governments in Brussels. This was especially the case in Mediterranean member states with executive led foreign policy making and very weak parliamentary control. In the 1970s and 80s, in other words, Federalists had insufficient understanding of the necessary dual legi legitimation of community politics, both at the national and at the European level. With the member states striking back in the course of the financial crisis and the rise of populism across Europe, the lack of national level control and legitimacy has become a huge problem for the European Union. In conclusion, I would like to plead for historicizing the debate about transnational European democracy. We need to understand visions and practices of governments and democracy in their time-specific context and problematize the legacies they have left for the European Union of the 21st century. This is not to deny the enormous historical achievements of post-war Western European integration. Foremost among these achievements <coughs> is the moderation and transnationalization of political rhetoric. Many community member states experienced quite dramatic domestic political polarization in the post-war period. This also impacted to some extent on European integration, such as when the German Social Democrat Democratic opposition leader Kurt Schumacher called Chancellor Konrad Adenauer the Chancellor of the Allies for his support of the coal and steel community or when French communists denounced Foreign Minister Robert Schumann as the German for his German accent and strong support for the Western integration of the Federal Republic of Germany. Actually, the fact that men in grey suits negotiated European integration after 1945 was a blessing, not uh, uh, that it would not have been desirable to have more women involved, but in this regard, European institutions merely reflected national politics. Rather, because their transnational political rhetoric marked a wonderful change from the extreme nationalism of charismatic leaders like Hitler and Mussolini. At the transnational level, post-war European integration created positive and even a positive and even importantly affectionate narrative of reconciliation, an emotive narrative of reconciliation that helped cool down tensions and fostered a spirit of cooperation. 
It is this narrative, almost more than the European Union as its institutionalized embodiment, that populist leaders in contemporary, contemporary Europe despise. They employ naked lies to attack their domestic opponents and their neighbors and to discredit European cooperation. Such, such as <clears throat> when Marine Le Pen in France recently claimed that Alsace-Lorraine would soon be occupied by Germany again, just because French President Emmanuel Macron supports German and French language acquisition on either side of the border with Germany. We are currently facing a major crisis of democracy in which the European Union is an easy target. So I recently told my oldest son, who has just turned 18, has gone to school in Germany, France, and Scotland, and is about to spend one year as a volunteer in Panama. All of the European Union's achievements could easily be lost in the space of the next five years. It is up to him and his generation, not very well represented here today, of course, in the European Union and in prospective future member states to preserve what is worth preserving and to protect Europe from its, from its worst nationalist enemies. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Evo, znači, čuli smo jedno vrlo zanimljivo i aktualno predavanje. Dakle, profesor Kazdar je čovjek koji se zaista najazbiljnije bavio istorijom evropskih integracija i narativa, kako bi smo vidjeli ovdje i akterima koji su posle drugog svjetskog rata, dakle, pokušavajući da pre svega stvore osnovu za mir, izgradili jedan problem, jedan sistem, koji danas, kao što smo videli u predavanju, se suočava sa raznoraznim problemima od krize demokratije preko finanske krize i tako dalje. I vrlo je zanimljivo, dakle, ovde što ga danas imamo upravo par dana posle evropskih izbora, dakle, tako da možemo sad u debati da ga pitamo šta se s ovim projektom danas dešava i kuda će ići. Dakle, imamo dosta prostora i za debatu. Izvolite. This is our colleague uh, uh, Mikhail Antonovic, uh, who is actually the, the wonderful PhD on Friedrich Meineke, mm -hmm. the only one in this area, actually a very good historian with German building, basically. Born in Germany, by the way. Resuverenizacije. Resuverenizacije. Hvala. So, uh, Mihal said, uh, uh, Mihal, uh, uh, well, I am not the expert for the uh, European integration and I would generally leave that aside, uh, the history and so on, but uh, he would like to ask about the, the future of the European project, actually and he tries to ask if it's possible somehow to avoid this generally perceived uh, uh, binar, if binar, let me say, opposition between uh, either more of EU and more of centralization, more of the Brussels on one side, and on the other hand, uh, this <coughs> is a populistic uh, uh, outcry for re-nationalization or re in, in some kind. Yeah. Do you want to collect some? No, no okay. Time you, to may, you, may you don't want to give me time to think no, about it. No, I don't give you time. You're the expert. Mm -hmm. I present you as an expert, so you have to fulfill <laughs> my expectation. I'm joking. Without, you know, you just, you can speculate, you know, so okay. and share our thoughts with us. Ja se malo šalim, znači, pitao je profesor, dakle, u smislu, da li bi mogli da skupimo više pitanja ili da direktno odgovara. Ja sam rekao, ok, da sam ga predstavio kao eksperte i da mu ne dam više vremena, tako da u suštini može da spekuliše i da nam odgovori ono što mu padne na pamet. Ok, please. 
Well, th uh, thank you very much. Thank you for this very difficult question. I actually, I actually asked him to simplify your questions for me so that they would be easier to answer, but he's refused to do that, apparently. Um, well, I think this binary opposition is, that, is, re is, is really is actually a problem, of course, mainly for European Union institutions, <coughs> because they are still fixated, and with good reason in some fields, on functional requirements for further integration. Some of these functional requirements are, I think, pretty evident, and very few people in Europe would deny them. Even many of the populist leaders would probably admit that there are functional requirements for cooperation. For example, through the processes of globalization and the need for international trade solutions. Uh, and it's obvious, although it's not obvious to everyone in the United Kingdom, that the European Union as a whole is a far stronger uh, partner of countries like the United States or China in international trade negotiations than countries individually. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we are in a country here where you are under pressure from the European Union, from Russia, China, and maybe even Turkey and so on, and where you probably have experience with how difficult it is as a small state or actor in such negotiations to um, stand your own. So there are such functional requirements. They re relate to globalization, to trade, to questions of standardization and norms, for example, where there are obvious needs for even further integration as technology develops, etc. Uh, probably also areas which are relatively uncontroversial, such as environmental change. A lot of challenges that are uh, inherently of a transnational character and cannot be solely addressed by an individual state. Because then, don't interrupt you, Peter, uh, just Sorry, you can also give a simplified answer, of course. No, no, it's okay. Yeah. I, I just have to write it down, and uh, it's about yeah. I will forget anyway, yeah. you know, just briefly. Znači, pokušavajući da odgovori nakon male čale, profesor Kajzer kaže da u suštini ove binarna opozicija sama po sebi jeste naravno problem, ali je ovaj ona pre svega vezana za ono što radi institucije i na fokusiranost Evropske komisije, dakle na institucije koje su sredsađene na funkcionalističke zahteve i rešavanje problema. Dakle, i kaže da recimo ono što on na što ukazuje, to su stvari gde čak i populistički lider u suštini nemaju ništa protiv. On naravno navodi pre svega pitanja globalizacije i rešavanja trgovinskih problema koje Evropa ima sa drugim partnerima, pa tako recimo odnosi sa Kinom i Rusijom. Naravno, mnogo je lakše svima da pregovaraju kao deo Evropske unije nego u pojedinačnom, pa je između oslovog rekao, evo kao i Srbija je mala država koja ipak kad pregovora sa velikom Kinom i Rusijom, dakle, nema mnogo prostora, možda bi lakše bilo kao neke velike, velikog prostora i to u Evropi pokušavaju da iskoriste. Tu su takođe ove pitanja normativnosti, standarda ili recimo klimatskih promena gde svi, pa čak, kako on kaže, populisti ne vide problem da se te stvari rešavaju na nekom višem nivou. Sorry. And that was, of course, only part of the one part of the binary divide. And at the same time, the problem with this is, of course, that we have this apparently relentless process of what would be appear like centralization from this populist narrative's perspective, and also a concrete feeling by citizens that decision-making is remote or increasingly remote from them. And I think the important thing is to understand is that this is not a problem that is limited to the European Union. I think in principle that's not different from the United States of America, where you have similar widespread popular feelings that decision making is remote and done by elites that mm -hmm. are disconnected from citizens. So it's not necessarily a particularity of the European Union, but it creates perhaps bigger political problems because the European Union is not a nation state unlike the United States. So here I think if you want me to propose a solution, I would come back to what is enshrined in the European uh, Treaty on European Union or the Lisbon Treaty nowadays, which is the principle of subsidiarity, which is originally a, co a concept from Catholic mm -hmm. social teaching, uh, which has acquired a political dimension, and which basically was not taken particularly seriously in the first 40, 50 years of European integration, because the idea was that all forms of integration would per se be good. But this idea of subsidiarity, which is also legally more clearly defined now, of course, tries to emphasize that such supranational forms of decision making are only legitimate and legal in the European Union if and when 
solutions to particular po policy problem cannot be found as well or better at a lower level of decision making. And this can be the national, but it can sometimes be a subnational, regional, or local level. Mm -hmm. So this is, of course, a well-established doctrine, but I think the important thing is to actually put this into practice. The European Commission is actually trying that. It has a program for getting rid of over-regulation, but these programs are not, this not very well understood or by, by individual citizens, experts know about this. But there are ways in which I think you can deregulate in the sense of getting rid of centralized over-bureaucratization, of getting the decision-making closer to the people in inverted commas without falling for the idea that everything can be done, everything can be done better by the nation state, which is what essentially nationalistic political leaders propagate, or populist political leaders uh, uh, propagate, sorry. Such as, last point, in the case of those who in the UK where I work uh, and partly live, uh, those who advocate a hard Brexit who really seem to think that if you renationalize everything by like, mm -hmm. leaving the European Union completely, you would somehow be able to take uh, to develop um, decision-making processes that are closer to the people and better and more efficient as well. And that is, in my view, certainly an absurdity and not true. Okay, just let's <coughs> make sure. Odbor je bio zaista vrlo lepo detaljno izložen. Ja ću probati da sistematizujem to na neki način i da ga složim. Pričali smo ovim, završili smo sa normama, standardnim i klinatskim promenama. Takođe, postoji naravno, kao što znamo, problem centralizacije generalno osjećaj građana da sa ovim napredovanjem proces integracija vlast ili mehanizam odlučivanja je sve više udaljen od pojedinačnih građana. Međutim, on podsjeća da je to isti problem koji imate u svim američkim državama. Dakle, da i tamo ljudi se sa pravom sve više žale da je elita odaljena od naroda i da o tome ne može da odlučuje, što u Evropi dodatno je povećano cijenjenicom da imamo pojedinače partikularne nacije od država još dodatno uplašeni za svoj nacionalni identitet. Što se tiče rešenja, između ova dva, dve binarne priče na koje je kolega Antolović ukaždao, Wolfram Kajzer podsjeća na jedan vrlo značajan koncept u sistemu evropskih integracija koje naravno postoji i od ranije u evropskim ugovorima, a posebno je naglašen 2007. u Lisabonskom ugovoru, dakle to je princip subsidijarnosti, dakle jedan koncept koji dolazi iz socijalnog učenja Rimokatoličke crkve, i za kojem kaže, čini se s punim pravom, da iako je bio upišan još u osnivačke ugovore, nikoga nije ozbiljno shvatao u protekli 40-50 godina, upravo zato što je dominirala ova ideologija da je svaka integracija, ma kakva ona bila i centralizovana na neki način dobra po sebi. Ideja tog koncepta je, dakle, da je integracija poželjna, odnosno da su nivoje vlasti na višem nivou prihvatljivi, preuzimanje različitih ingerencija, samo ako na nižem nivou zaista problem ne može da se reši. Dakle, tu doktrina nije sporna uopšte i mnogi bi je prihvatili i unutar Evropske unije, ali kaže da je problem u tome što je slaba primjena i što nije ozbiljno rađeno da se ta ideja zaista ozbiljno primjeni, pa recimo ima činjenica da Evropska komisija, dakle kao najcentralnija institucija Evropske unije, ima svoje programe za deregulaciju i tako dalje, što je opet samo po sebi kontradiktorno centralna institucija promoviše decentralizaciju i tako dalje. Međutim, ono na što on ukazuje da je problem ako se to, taj problem decentralizacije i povratka demokratizacije na neki način rešavanja problema na nižem nivo vrati samo na nivo nacije. Dakle, i on živi inače kao Nemac živi u Britaniji i potpuno je naravno pod utiskom onoga što se dešava oko Brexita sada i kaže takozvani zagovornici tvrdog Brexita, dakle pod svaku cenu izlazka iz Evropske unije, koji s jedne strane žele da obnove suverenitet i demokratska prava u odnosu na Brisel, no s druge strane su apsolutno nezainteresovani da vrate demokratska prava i centralnim nivojima i oni smatruju da bi jedna nova centralizacija u Velikoj Britaniji mogla da bude rešenje za odbranu suvereniteta. I try to summarize this. Please go on. Možemo dalje, izvolite. Izvolite. 
imali pitanje? Ne, dobro, razumijem vas, ono, probat ću da, da, ok. So, gentlemen was mostly asking about the system of values today when you speak about transnational democracy, in the sense, what we should be, how we should be placed, what values could be enshrined somehow within the, that system. Razumem, ok. Ideas, values, uh, how who, to, to base actually today, transnational democracy somehow. So the question is not about how it, this is. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, okay. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I so okay. Please. Well, if I understood the question correctly, I, I, I think there are two points. To this. The first one would be that in the context of the European Union or any form of transnational context, what we can only do, I think, is to institutionalize a set of norms that are largely procedural more than substantive. Mm -hmm. So, for example, mm -hmm. the, those norms that are already, of course, institutionalized in the European Union relate to the protection of the or implementation of the rule of law, protection of human rights, to the principle of democratic election and processes from the bottom up and similar uh, mm -hmm. largely procedural norms, mm -hmm. if you like, that uh, are constitutive for a pluralistic form of political system. Um, what I think would be much more uh, difficult is if we had to agree, for example, on as a norm on the form of environmental protection, mm -hmm. you know, policy-related norms that we would want to agree to. This is something that I think in the transnational context has to be open to competition. What kind of form of what is the particular value, if I want to stick with this example, of, for example, uh, environmental protection in the light of climate change. These are things that need to be debated and, and have to be, con or will naturally be contested, okay. and where there has to be some kind of formation of a majoritarian view that is in some form implemented and temporarily for a period of four, five, five years in the European mm -hmm. Union. So I think this distinction between the more procedural norms. I think that, uh, sorry, if I can just yeah, make one, one more point. point. Okay, yeah, one more point. Is I think that this, if we concentrate on these kinds of norms and values, then we have less problem with the great divergence, which you already have within countries, mm -hmm. but of course you have even more within the uh, larger political space, like the European Union, of diverging substantive norms and understandings. Mm -hmm. For example, the question of abortion, to just mm -hmm. give you an example, mm -hmm. uh, or we, we discussed uh, earlier that in Serbia very often the European Union is uh, seen as an organization that pushes particular uh, liberal uh, values or norms and maybe to impose them on more co in the world commerce conservative or traditionally or and that's certainly a conflict that appears to be
purposes. But so then I think it's easier to accommodate divergences of norms and traditions uh, in substantive terms in areas of social policy, for example, which are in any case largely still nowadays national level competence. And to allow this divergence and pluralism in the European Union I think is essential for allowing the cohesion on these procedural norms uh, which the European Union has fixed which were originally in the Copenhagen criteria and are now in the Lisbon Treaty. Okay. Dakle, ono na odgovoru na šta je profesor probao da se usmeri, to je taj, da kažem, na neki način razlika između nekog normativnog proceduralnog nivoa s jedne strane i drugo ono što su sadržaji oko koji se ljudi jako mnogo spore i dakle on tvrdi da je da bi se u Evropskoj uniji prosto kad govorimo o transnacionalnoj demokratiji i njenoj izgradnji po njemu mnogo važnije fokusirati se na ono što jeste dostižno a to je taj proceduralni nivo dakle stvari kao što su vladovina prava postojanje nekih osnovnih ljudskih prava koje su prihvaćene svuda onda taj bottom up pristup dakle od od Ozdo ka Nagore što jeste neki demokratski pristup suprotno centralizaciji koju naravno niko ne voli i tako dalje i generalne norme dakle konstitucionalizacije postepene puzajeće jednog prostora što bi bilo mnogo lakše i prihvatljivo nego sadržajna pitanja jer sadržajna pitanja u principu zbog tradicija različitih norma i tako dalje, suštinski dele ljudi, iako bi se na sadrženim nivojima pokušalo da se graje transnacionalna demokratija, tu kaže na nevropskom nivou ne bi se mnogo šta uradilo. Recimo, on daje taj primer oko normi, definisanja normi ili pravila, dakle, politike prema klimatskim promenama na prostoru Evropske unije. I tu zaista postoji ogromna velika razlika, ovo ja malo dodajem, ali da razjasnimo, dakle, u skandinavskim zemljama gde je nivo nužne zaštite te mnogo veći onoga što je evropski prosek od recimo južnih zemalja koje mnogo manje vode računa o tome i koje smatruju da taj viši nivo zaštite klimatske bi faktički podrio osnovu njihovog ekonomskog života, industrije i tako dalje. Mora vam kaže takve stvari moraju da se rešavaju ozbiljnim dugoročnim debatama, dakle da recimo aranžmani koji bi se napravili treba oročiti ih na pet godina pa onda videti ponovo, dakle da te stvari koje jesu suštinski problematični za ljude treba rešavati, ali sa nekim postepenim otvorenim prostorima za ponovnu debatu i tako dalje. Ključ je posebno u ovoj današnjoj vrlo složenoj i kompleksnoj sukubljenoj Evropi, dakle po nemu smanjiti unutrašnje sukube koji su pre svega vezani za sadržene probleme i tu daje primjer recimo abortusa gde je Poljska, Mađarska na primjer ima vrlo različite stave u odnosu na ono što je nekim mainstreamu u levu liberalnom u Evropi, ili ja sam danas pričao o naše probleme, pa je on pomenuo danas gde se stalno gura gej parada, ljudi nemaju šta da jedu, a da se ta priča nameće kao negde dominantna i tako dalje. I da u suštini je to odgovor njegov vraćanja na ono što je neki normativna osnova kao PH-ški kriterijum, ono što jeste jedan set vrednosti koje treba da budu univerzalno prihvaćene, ali izbeći one fundamentalne sukobe da se ne bi raspao ceo sistem. Ok, hvala. Idemo dalje. Kolega Perišić, izvolite. Mnogo više, dakle, imate usput tri grupacije koje imaju sve zajedno preko 220, 210, 220 koje su vrlo skeptiče, plus Orban, plus ovi radikali na levici, vrlo je blizu trećine, dakle, ljudi koji su van konsenzusa u principu. Was that my answer? Yeah, of course, I only answered your question, you know. I just... No, okay, no, I'm joking, of course, you know. Our colleague actually wanted to use your 
presence here, uh, starting from what we were and uh, speaking about uh, democracy and national yeah. democracy at European level, and uh, uh, following uh, uh, that uh, approach, what would we say now after the, the results of the, uh, these um, elections? So actually, he, that's why I just added, uh, he said, well, uh, this is the rise of the uh, Eurosceptics in some way, like 70 mm -hmm. or something, and I said, no, it's, it's far bigger, so I gave the, this uh, result in which more or less de facto it's almost one third of the MPs of these different groups, including uh, ra uh, <coughs> radical left wing, which is also Melanchon and the guys who are very skeptical in some way. So actually, his his idea w was de facto what were the consequences of this kind of the results for the forming of the European Commission and generally for the future of Euro, uh, EU and uh, uh, European democracy. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, well, actually, I think when you look at the results, yes, it's one third if you take all of these different mm -hmm. groups together mm -hmm. on the left where they have actually shrunk. So it's important yeah. to point yeah. out in Greece and uh, the Greek governing party has not done very well and has called an election now, national election. Mm -hmm. Uh, they haven't actually done very well in the French system either. So the, gr the group of the radical left parties has actually shrunk in the European Parliament. Also, I think on the right, you have, of course, a great uh, variety of different mm -hmm. groups from skeptical Europeans, but not opposed to the European Union or membership as such, to those who are opposed to some policies like the Euro, but not opposed to the EU. For example, the well, now it's called, of course, no, Ralliement uh, uh, National, the Front National, mm -hmm. formerly Front National, no longer is in favor of leaving the European Union. So there are also shifts in these political positions. But if you're right, if you take all of these different disparate groups together, it's about one third. But I think they're very different, and it's not easy to lump them together. That's the first point. The second point is actually most of these parties have done worse than they had hoped. So there are reasons for that that we can perhaps discuss if you like. Um, but uh, essentially, I think there has been a mobilize. What we're now seeing is not just the mobilization of your skepticism, but also the mobilization of your enthusiasm, mm -hmm. which is interesting. So th since Brexit, particularly, I think we all we already saw that in the French presidential elections. Also, political parties. That's true for largely for the Liberal parties in the centre, for example, are actually advocating more integration or are uh, speaking in very positive terms about the European Union. So we have this counter mobilization mm -hmm. as well or among those who are in favor of the European Union and European integration, but largely accepted this or took this for granted for a very long time and now realize that it's under threat. So I think that has contributed to some of these political parties not doing as well as they expected. Even the Lega thought that they would get 35 or 36 percent, I think it's about 5 percent or something less. Uh, if you look at the UK case, Brexit, 52% uh, in the referendum for Brexit, and now it's clear that the hard Brexit support is about 34% in these elections, and the hard remain support is 44%, and then the rest is some. So actually, they haven't done so well would be mm -hmm. my second mm -hmm. short answer. And the third answer is that this, of course, will require in the European Parliament more cross-party cooperation, which will also be more ad hoc than in the past, because until Sunday or until the 1st of July, the two largest groups, the Christian Democrats, the European People's Party and the Socialists, had a majority, so very often they worked with this majority, and then uh, on some issues they were also changing majorities in the European Parliament. So that's no longer possible. That requires more cooperation with groups like the Greens or the Liberals, etc. Mm -hmm. That's the third point. And the fourth point, because you also asked about the appointment of the Commission President. That's very unclear. What is clear is that the so-called Spitzen, to use the German term, Spitzenkandidat, mm -hmm. will no longer just be appointed because he comes from the largest political group. So I think for the Bavarian CSU Spitzenkandidat of the European People's Party, Weber, it will not be enough to say we've got 174, whatever the final number is, of the seats and we are the largest group. This was essentially the EPP's argument when Juncker became Commission President mm -hmm. five years ago. Mm -hmm. so that's not going to be enough, but he, well, whoever wants to be elected or uh, proposed by the uh, ministers in the or the prime ministers in the council and then supported by the parliament will have to draw on broader 
a semi-coalition type of support. And I think on that basis, someone like the socialist leader or the liberal leader as a possible compromise candidate could mm -hmm. also mm -hmm. become commission president. Whether the member states, some of whom like Macron have said, well, we don't like this entire system, we should re-centralize this decision making on us as member state governments, whether that, that will happen is really an entirely open question. So there will be changes. I think there needs to be more inventive, if you like, forms of collaboration in the parliament. But at the same time, I think it's also clear that these grown um, populist parties will also have, of course, first of all, to try and forge new groups in the European parliament. And it's not so clear on the basis of the last th experience of the last 30 years that the right-wing populist parties can easily do that. They have always been very bad at getting organized in the European Parliament. So this may now change, not entirely clear. They somehow have to accept the fact that they have to continue to deal with European integration within the European Union. And whether they want to take a completely oppositional approach mm -hmm. or some of them may want to say, well, actually, we will moderate our opposition, which some have done, like Le Pen, for example, mm -hmm. and contribute or cooperate under certain conditions is something that is open. So there are questions not just for those in favor of the EU, but also for those who are critical of it as well. Okay, thank you. Ovo je bilo zaista vrlo, vrlo detaljno, pa da probam da ga sažmem. Što se tiče rezultate izbora, pre svega, dakle, na ovu moju konstataciju da je kad se skupe, dakle, svi ovi ove različite grupe na desnici, ali i radikalna leveca koji su suprotni koncesusa, to dolazi maltene do jedne trećine. On kaže, jeste to, jeste tačno. S jedne strane, međutim, on opet kao neko ko očigledno je podržava pre svega ono što je mainstream i pokušava da obrani do sadašnje mainstream politike, probao je da nađe argumente koji idu malo suprotno tome i dakle da ospori da je ovaj standardnu priču o usponu populista i ukazuje na sledeće činjenice. Prvo levica, recimo radikalna levica, Melan Šovn, Siriza, na primjer i tako dalje, je dosta pala, pre svega zbog manjeg uspeha i Melan Šovna i Sirize i tu je sada sa nekih 45-6, na primjer, palo se na 39 poslanika. Na desnici, što se tiče tih dešavanja, kaže, jeste tu ima dosta ovo što sam ja rekao, preko 200 poslanika faktički koji ulaze u te tri grupe, dakle, Evropa, reformista i konzervativaca, onda nacionalno, odnosno ono što se naziva Salvinijeva frakcija i treće, dakle, ovo gde su Brexit i Di Majo i tako dalje, Evropa, direktne demokratije. I kaže, tu je međutim došlo do ozbiljnih pomaka u odnosu na ranije pozicije. Naprimer, dao je primer Lepenove partije koja više ne zagovara napuštanje Evropske unije. Dakle, generalno i na tom prostoru došlo je do omekšavanja diskursa. Drugi argument njegov je da su oni lošije prošle suštinske nego što su očekivali. Jeste, to je značajno uspeh, ali, na primer, kaže, Liga je po nekim proročanima i zaista jednom trenutku očekivala da ide na 35%, da bi u 29% nesumno ne povedla, ali ne toliko koliko su, recimo, očekivali, što čini se može pre svega da dodam da se kaže za germanski prostor da je AFD na 10%, štrati posle kare na 17-18%, tako da je oni su očekivali da će na 30%. 25, a ovamo u jednom trenutku je AFD krenuo na 15%, pa je posle dosta pao. I ukazuje da je recimo došlo do, kao što su oni se mobilisali na svojim agendama, takođe isto, posebno posle Brexita je došlo i smatra da je to dalo određene rezultate do mobilizacije takozvanih herventuzijasta, Dakle, pre svega, recimo, na franskim izborima se je to videla jedna mobilizacija centra liberalnog prostora, onih koji poput Makrona zagovaraju čak veće integracije kao rešenje za ove probleme sa kojima se sluča. Daje primer, recimo, iz Ujedinjenog kraljevstva, odnosno Britanije, gde je pristavice takozvanog tvrdog Brexita napuštenja brzog po svaku cenu su osvojile 3-4%, dok, recimo, 4-4% je onih koji su radikalno protiv Brexita, a ovi ostali su negde između. Dakle, ono što se tiče budućnosti, 
više će morati da bude međupartijske saradnje. Očigledno i to je najozbiljnija posledica da dve vodeće grupacije, IPP i SDP, dakle socijalisti i Evropska narodna partija, koji su do ovih izbora imali jasnu većinu, dakle i mogli sami da formiraju vladu na neki način, to više ne mogu da urade i da će oni morati da uključe liberale i liberalne demokrate, dakle ovu grupaciju ALD i koja je dosta porasla pre svega zbog Makrona na ovim izborima i zelene koje su naj, kako se to kaže, prijatne iznenađenje na ovim izborima što se tiče mainstreama. I završava se pričom o predsedniku Evropske komisije, Tu je vrlo komplikovana priča, dakle, do sada, dok je IPP jasno imao veliku većinu, oni su recimo na prošlim izborima dobili 220 i nešto poslanika, sada su pali na 170 i nešto, sa sve Orbanom, Orbanovih 13, koji, dakle, je pitanje da li će tu ostati. Dakle, on smatra da IPP više nije u situaciji da može jasno da diktira, kao on prošli put sa Junkerom, da diktira ko će biti špican kandidat, odnosno one ko će formirati komisiju. U trenutku oni će morati da izađu u razgovore sa još nekoliko grupacija i kaže nije isključeno da možda se desi da recimo socijaldemokrata ili čak liberal ili zeleni bude neko ko će formirati nominalnu komisiju ako dođe do trgovine i pregovora na tom nivou. Dakle, potpuno se i to je ono što je zaključak Mnogo je komplikovanija politika sada, došlo je do prekomponove novog sistema i na kraju je zaključio ponovo vraćajući se na takozvanu populističku, populitički izazov, da je uprkos očiglednom rastu tih partije u ovih pet godina, da je sada zaista otvara se pitanje u budućnosti kako će oni s jedne strane taktički funkcionisati, da li će moći da prave ad hoc koalicije, dogovore i tako dalje, ili će biti ono što će ih razvajati, neki od njih će recimo ići u pravcu bliže saradnje, možda sa mainstreamom i tako dalje, tako da u svakom slučaju otvara se čitav niz vrlo ozbiljne dinamike na ovom prostoru. Ok, I think I have been pretty precise. Izvolite, naša koleginica... Okay, so uh, our young colleagues, Sonia, uh, she's working at our institute as well mm -hmm. for Novi Sad, uh, uh, asked about uh, neocorporativism and generally about the role of corporations uh, today and uh, a system of um, uh, decision making at the level of the European Union. Actually, generally, she wanted to focus on lobby groups. Mm -hmm. uh, what is their I influence today? Is it uh, uh, rising or is it decreasing? And especially in, in light of, for example, this new dynamic, if we could say, within the uh, parliament and possibly within the European Commission in the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, perhaps, uh, first of all, I should say that uh, my emphasis in the lecture on the influence of these kinds of Corporates or new corporate forms of cooperation was to highlight where the consensus and I think these for these practices rather the often informal practices I think have largely inspired the search for consensus and this consensus orientation so I wasn't so keen to explain the actual uh, influence of business on politics and policy making in my particular lecture but if you are interested in that of course you probably know this literature there is a general dispute about the character of the uh, political system of the European Union between more pluralistic and more mm -hmm. pluralistic or more neo-corporatist 
form and decision-making processes. And the European Union is somewhere in the middle because you have, of course, strongly a pluralistic competition for interest, but then at the same time you have attempts channeled largely by the European Commission to actually structure this process of competitive lobbying into something that resembles more consociational, to use this Austrian term, or, mm. um, or cooperative forms of politics and policy making. So in the last 10, 15 years or so, the European Commission has partic put particular emphasis on the idea that these stakeholders, at, as they were called at one point in the British system and then also in the European Union system, should get their act together horizontally also between uh, different industry organizations and individual companies and mm -hmm. so on, but also NGOs, trade unions and other interests, uh, organized interests that have a particular stake in a policy area and should come up with a pre-arranged consensus among themselves mm -hmm. that they can then present to the Commission as something that is uh, technically of good quality, efficient, and also will enjoy enough legitimacy among a wide variety of stakeholders. So this is a form of fairly um, consensus-oriented and neo for cooperative forms of um, production of, of policy proposals that can then be taken through this institution system of the European Union that I think is strikingly non-pluralistic. So what we have, I think, is in many policy areas quite co uh, cooperative uh, structures of policy making. And then in cases where individual companies or industries see a particular interest as massively threatened by such a possible consensus, they then use either the national route, where if they are particularly based in a big country or they have a particularly strong economic stake in a, particular, in a big country and therefore national influence, they use the national route mm. or they lobby directly at the European Union level either through the parliament or you know, others, other institutions that are involved in the policy making process. This is something that I don't th see as being affected by the uh, results of the mm. European Parliament elections in any significant way because it will still be possible by the Parliament to produce majorities in order to influence the policy making process. I don't think that the policy making process will reconcentrate mm. entirely on the member states and the Council or the Commission in the production of the policy proposals, just because the Parliament is somewhat more fragmented. Mm -hmm. uh, this would be different, I think, if you know the Eurosceptic parties mm -hmm. in double mm -hmm. inverted commas were to hold 50% of the seats mm -hmm. in the European Parliament, but that's not the case. Okay, just the Uh, dakle, uh, profesor Kadzir je najpre uh, podsjetio da u svom predavanju se on fokusirao na uh, utice korporacija na građanje konsenzusa, dakle, u pokušaju izgradnje jedinstvene evropske demokratije tokom ovih uh, 40-50 godina i videli ste, to je jako, neseća se zaista mnogo u teoriji, to ukazivanje na onaj konsenzus koje su pre svega finansijske i ekonomske elite gradile i pre nego što je izgradnje Evropske unije, tako da to jeste jedan bio nadnacionalni model koji su onda prihvatili i tehnokrati i tako dalje. Generalno je podsjetio da danas u tretmanu Evropske unije i nadnacionalnih integracija postoji taj spor između pluralizma ili korporativizma, dakle, i da je Evropska unija negde u sredini. U suštini, kad objašnjava model kako lobiji danas funkcioniš u Evropskoj uniji, kaže da je to jedna kompetitivno lobiranje, ali preko takvog modela konsocijativnosti. U suštini, šta je Evropska komisija radi? Ona traži od korporacija, od lobby grupa, od čak i NGO-a, ne vladnih organizacija, da se horizontalno organizuju, da oni dođu pred komisiju sa unapred dogovorenim svojim interesima. Prosto hoće da izbjegnu jedan haos u kome im svako pojedinačno prilazi i to su već postojeći, oni koji znaju Europske integracije i sistem Europske unije znaju da postoje organizovani predstavnici i rade i kapitala s druge strane i da te organizacije dolaze pred Evropsku komisiju, dakle, u ovom obliku koji je izbjegavala pluralizam, dakle, traži se jedna vrsta zajedničke regulacije sa kojom onda Evropska komisija pregovara i, dakle, uglavnom je fokusirano na to traženje konsenzusa među tim igračima. Međutim, naravno, veliki igrači, kad imaju posebne interese, 
često traže ili pojedinačno lobiranje, što je bilo slučajeva, dakle, da neke velike kompanije traže direktno prijem kod, ne znam, različitih komesara ili čak i kod predsjednika komisije, ili da koriste posebno, recimo, ne znam, nemačke firme, na primjer, velike, utice iz svoje zemlje koje onda brani njihove partikularne interese. Što se tiče odgovora na to da li će ova fragmentacija Evropskog parlamenta uticati na ovaj sistem, on smatra da neće, da ova malo veća šira koalicija, ljudi koji će ipak ostati vezani za konsenzus, će vjerojatno očuvati taj sistem, a da smatra da bi drugačije bilo i to zaista bi bilo, da su recimo populisti koji su prilično usmereni protiv korporativnih interesa dobili na primjer 50% i onda bi mogli zaista da ospore to ili da na drugačiji način zasnuju sistem lobiranja i interesa. Kolega Ajić. I can start with the Farage part. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> 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 um, okay. Okay. So the whole idea was, um, uh, since you, of course, you know, uh, uh, speaking about democracy and uh, mm -hmm. building of EU, uh, which was generally in many ways uh, um, uh, Christian Democrat, uh, uh, let me say movement or entrepreneurship, or let me say project, mm -hmm. modern mm -hmm. speaking, uh, as we know, until the late 60s, social democracy was very reserved and then entered into the whole system. So actually, uh, w when you take a look uh, about current position of EPP, with uh, uh, Orban still inside, but mm -hmm. maybe outside. They have dramatically reduced their support and popularity and influence uh, in that sense. And uh, Sasha mentioned actually, so what is now expected is actually that uh, so-called uh, Christian Democrats, um, at least by in a name or let me say by tradition, are joining their forces with uh, left liberals or maybe Greens who are also very, I don't know, uh, ideologically opposed to what uh, Christian Democrats used to be. And uh, uh, he asked uh, uh, in pragmatical sense, is it maybe right move to them? Uh, maybe it can happen to them like with the Tories in, uh, in, in Britain, for example, that uh, they start uh, uh, to lose even more support of their, let me say, traditional supported. Maybe he asked, uh, could it be possible at all or could it be more wiser for them for strategical reasons? to avoid entering into this coalition and maybe for some time to stay in a position to let, for example, Social Democrats, Greens and, and Liberals organize uh, uh, the power. Uh, because he mentioned, uh, at least in theory or informally, voters who vote for Christian Democrats probably don't see themselves uh, uh, much more closer to Greens or left Liberals than to, I don't know, some of the populists who insist on traditional values and so on and so on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, well, I think what is important um, for my answer here is that the Christian Democrats, uh, first of all, yes, you're absolutely right, were, of course, at the origins of Euro West European integration in this core Europe of the six founding member states, but it's also really only there, and plus it's Switzerland and Austria and so on a little bit, where they had this particular 
post-war Christian democratic identity, which I've briefly alluded to, but we don't have time to discuss in any detail. So the first point, my first point would be they have enlarged progressively, and they were over, let's put it this way, they were overconfident, particularly after the end of the Cold War, that mm -hmm. through this enlargement to political parties from countries where mm -hmm. you have more Catholic or conservative uh, non-Christian democratic, in this sense, party traditions, they would be able to socialize these other political parties, whether they were from Ireland or from Spain or from Eastern European countries in the 2004 and 7 enlargements, into this older Christian democratic consensus. And I think they are finding now that this has only worked to a very limited extent, mm -hmm. that these different long-term political traditions, um, histories of ideas and party ideology, or ideology, etc., these divergent have persisted to a very large mm -hmm. degree and they are coming into the open more again mm -hmm. now. And uh, this is a realization, I think, that, that th they have realized this. Let's put it this way. Mm -hmm. I recently interviewed, for example, the Secretary General of the European People's Party group in the European Parliament, Martin Kamp, and he was very outspoken about that and said, we believed after the end of the Cold War, this was our project in a sense, this mm -hmm. was the end of history from our perspective regarding the European Union. Everyone would want to join the European Union and all of these center-right political parties would want to join mm -hmm. us as a group mm -hmm. and they would sh largely share our values and our objectives for the European Union. And the case of Orban is just a particularly striking case that that's largely not the case. And here I'm talking mainly about the European Union as a political organization and the desirability to integrate it more deeply and make it a cohesive actor internally and externally in international relations. So on that point, Orban clearly disagrees. Yeah? So that's the first point. The group has become very heterogeneous. It's just a broad center-right church mm -hmm. in inverted commas uh, in, in party political terms. That had internal heterogeneity is a big problem for the EPP. Um, then you can, s a second point is you can make this argument about the greater distance between the more mm, conservative elements, if you like, within the, this group of the European People's Party from some Greens or left liberals or uh, socialists, as you said, in the European Parliament on grounds of ideology regarding social, uh, so social policy preferences particularly, I would say. Um, and social economic perhaps to some extent. But the problem from your perspective would be that the EPP core parties from Western Europe are very strongly still very strongly committed to this notion of a more federal European Union. Mm -hmm. so they don't want to compromise that. And if they have to choose between working with left liberals or Greens on protecting the European Union institutionally on its path to some kind of Federal Union, inverted commas, they may well prefer that over protecting more mm -hmm. traditional social values in cooperating with um, um, populist parties on the right who are opposed and sometimes fundamentally opposed to this European Union as such or even membership in the European Union. This is a stark choice for them, of course, so they basically realize that they may have to shrink <laughs> to become more homogeneous again in one way or another. Mm -hmm. And I think the general expectation regarding Orban is that he will leave anyway independent of what the EPP is doing, that's more concretely. So you might say, well, strategically this might be a better choice, but I don't think it's easily compatible for these parties from Northwestern Europe in this or based in this tradition. It would be a very difficult choice to make and to leave the European Union, if you like, to these center-left and left political parties entirely would be very hard. Sorry? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, of course, that's may maybe my, my third point, that when you look at the European Parliament party system, we are going in the direction a little bit of the Dutch system, which already mm -hmm. 20, 25 years ago was beginning to fragment more and more into different groups, which are individual political parties in the European Parliament groups, that then become somewhat more cohesive, but it individually, and no longer have this internal diversity, but they then have this diversity among the groups, and they mm -hmm. will have to work together, nevertheless, to form some kind of formal or informal coalition uh, and that's going to pose a very significant challenge thank you very much this was very very <coughs> useful uh, explanation of what is really going on and what is happening uh, let me translate treba se podsjetiti toga da je IPP odnosno taj korp hrišćanske demokrate ipak kretao od jedne relativno 
homogene sredine. Dakle, prvo sećamo se Evropsku ekonomsku zajednicu, pravilo je šest zemalja, uglavnom je to neki katolički prostor bio, koji su imali jedan jasan identitet. Međutim, što se dešava je posle hladnog rata i to je ono na što on ukazuje, dolazi do jednog pretranog velikog proširenja IPP, odnosno cele ove grupacije, na neke nove zemlje i smatra da je to bilo izuzetno i previše ambiciozno. Dakle, tu su naravno grupe centar, desnica i zemalja kao što su Irska, Španija, Istočna Evropa i tako dalje i očigledno ovi rezultati pokazuju da sve to nije dovelo do socijalizacije, odnosno inkluzije tih grupa koje bi prihvatili ono što su bile vrednosti u nekom centralnom prostoru, dakle, odnosno njihovog adoptiranja na jednu vrstu faktičke evolucije koja su IPP-u dešavalo i to očigledno ne funkcioniše po rezultatima koji se sada vide, ali i po nekim drugim stvarima. Generalni sekretar IPP-a Kampf je nedavno u intervju objašnjavao ovu situaciju gde tvrdi da prosto verilo se da dolazi posle hladnog rata do kraja svih podela, da svi hoće u Evropsku uniju, prema tome sve desne partije hoće u IPP-i da su na taj način pokušavali da integrišu sve, da bi danas došli do problema Orban, za koga svi smatruju da je direktno suprot, iako je član IPP-a i uz to sam Orban insistira vrlo mnogo da ostane unutar Evropske narodne partije, međutim tamo gotovo da postoji konsenzus da njega treba eliminisati zbog, da kažemo, različitog odnosa prema Evropskoj uniji, jer se smatra da je odbrana evrofederalizacije na neki način i dalje jedna od osnovnih postulata IPP-a i smata da je ono što je jako veliki problem, ta ogromna heterogenost koja je dovela dotle da unutar same IPP-a počinju svi veći problemi. Druga stvar, dakle, da, tu je napravio neku vrstu sažetka odgovarajući na ono što je Saša pitao, dakle, u pogledu socijalnih vrednosti, onoga što se nazvao socijalni konzervativizam, odnosno društvi konzervativizam, gde da, zaista, mnogi u IPP još uvek bi bili bliži populistima ili ovim novim radikalnim desnici konzervativcima, međutim, on podsjeća da opet IPP doživljava odbrnu zajedničke Evrope kao ono što je mnogo važnija stvar i da su unutar te dileme o kojoj Saša govori, dakle, koji god izbor da donesu, gube na neki način, da se nalaze pred jednim vrlo teškim izborom, da u suštini čini se da i svesno pomalo idu u pravcu da očiste ovu heterogenosti, da se ponovo fokusiraju na neku vrstu homogenosti koja bi možda donala jaču i precizniju borbu za stvari koje su im važne i da, što se tiče ove ideje, da odu u opoziciju, misli da je to teško izvodljivo, da gube u svakom slučaju i da oni zapravo Evropu, Evropsku uniju i Evropsku integraciju vide kao svoj projekat koji prosto ne žele da ispuste odnosno učešće u upravljanju njime, posebno u ovako problematičnom trenutku i kao budućnost toga u kom pravcu sve ovo ide, Evropskog parlamenta navodi holandski sistem koji je već neko vreme evoluirao i u kome imate desetak političkih partija sa manjim uticajem koje su vrlo različite s jedne strane, ali koje je vreme polako trebalo da počnu iz tog pluralizma da grade neku novu vrstu kohezije i da prevazila za razlike kako bi pre svega očuvale sistem. I ja ću sad da zlopotrebim, evo, privodim kraju, ja imam isto na dva pitanja, pa sam teo da ga zamolim i mislim da bismo time mogli polako da privodimo kraju, već smo skoro dva sata ovde. So, at the end, I also wanted to ask you a couple of things. Of course, to, to uh, thank you very much for not only presentation, but also very, very uh, precise and useful and actual current uh, responses to, to what we heard about what is really going on. So, two things I will try to formulate them, if it's possible, um, uh, in, a, in a short way. Uh, speaking about the uh, uh, role of the cartels in uh, uh, your, your second uh, uh, vision or point actually in uh, uh, as the something which was creating patterns or in, uh, uh, inducing actually um, uh, more of the cooperation at the supranational, supranational level, 
Um, actually, I'm, I'm coming from the situation in which now, uh, today, not only populists, but many people really um, see banks or financial system as, let me say, uh, the only really functioning cartel uh, in Europe, uh, which is uh, ruining mostly uh, European democracy somehow. Uh, and as you see from Salvini to Le Pen, uh, but I can see also that even among social democrats from time to time, people uh, uh, complain that actually uh, banks uh, didn't take their own uh, uh, part of responsibility for the crisis in either in the solving crisis that they were spared somehow and even helped uh, by the state. So actually, uh, how would you put that, uh, uh, I'm, I'm trying to make loose connections, from cartels before uh, who you, you introduced actually all the liberalism and introduction of a, a, a demonopolization which function really in many ways and even today's we, we see that functioning, and on the other hand, if we could say something which we could call like oligarchy of the banking system, which is uh, pretty much uh, uh, removed from the interest of uh, ordinary people, and very often seen as maybe one of the biggest problems for democracy and general system in Europe. And the second thing is, uh, uh, just briefly, I, I, I would like to, to you, although you, you already touched it upon, uh, uh, many people uh, uh, emphasized actually that the part from the results of the elections, uh, maybe the, the, the most important thing is actually this increase of the turnout of the vote, you know, that after permanent decreasing with every new election which came to 42, I think, at the last elections, now it has risen to significant 52% and uh, that for the first time we saw that it really matters mm -hmm. to people, young people, populists, supporters, whatsoever. And uh, uh, is it, is it uh, in some way, uh, uh, if I would like to, to explain why was it, I think that's basically because of populists who really increased that, which moved uh, to, uh, as you said, counter mobilization and so on. So actually you will see politics returning back mm -hmm. somehow in, in European Parliament, like it happened with, with IFD in German Parliament, because you had some consensus which people didn't see really as too democratic. So I know on one hand you have these very, you know, problematic issues. There were very, very big uh, uh, debate within Germany about what does it mean with IFD, but definitely they have returned to the, well, politics and pluralization and democracy. Is it in some way at least a good thing for Europe or maybe that can really somehow soften this outcry that there is no democracy anymore in Europe anymore. Mm -hmm. And I will just briefly to to yeah, uh, yeah. to, to that. Uh sam pitao, postavio dva pitanja uh, govoreći o uh, kartelima i ulozi kartela u uh, građanju ove transeuropske demokratije, probao sam da napravim paralelu sa onim što se dešava sa bankama i bankarskim sistemom, odnosno oligarhijom bankara u Evropi, koji danas jesu jedno od najjačih transnacionalnih bratstava, ali da razni ljudi od populista pa do socijaldemokrata i tako dalje, vrlo često s pravom, kukaju da je upravo ta vrsta kartelizacije nešto što direktno podriva evropsku demokratiju. A drugo pitanje je išlo u ovom pravcu da sam ukazao na to da imamo porast broja birača skoro za 10% na ovim izborima, i da to govori o tome da su ljudi posle dužeg vremena imali osjećaj da politika i glasanje su stvarno važni i da je došlo do mobilizacije i na jednom i na drugom frontu i tako dalje i da to slično kao u Nemačkoj nakon prošlih izbora gde je AFD ušao u parlament je razbilo taj konsenzus na neki način ali vratilo više pluralizma i vratilo politiku sukobe oko nekih osnovnih vrednosti i pitao sam ga da li je to zaista, da li vidi u tome dobru ili lošu stvar. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much. Both questions are, of course, very difficult, and I understand that we are pressed for time, so I'll try to be a little bit yeah, okay. shorter than in some of my other answers. The, on the first question, what I tried to do analytically by talking about the cartel tradition was to highlight how it 
uh, fostered a culture of cooperation. Now uh, that this form of cooperation, of course, can also create, uh, has also downsides, is obvious. So clearly cartels, of course, were formed in order to agree prices or to uh, mm. cave up markets and to increase shareholder value, you know, the old private, um, make the private uh, family owners richer, etc. And this is why the ordo liberal tradition, of course, opposed cartels and, and the European Union has an anti-cartel competition based competition policy. So similarly, when you ask about the banks, I think mm -hmm. this form of uh, cooper cooperative patterns where banks, of course, also continuously have been engaged recently in illegal practices that, have, that however, have also been uncovered by the European Commission, mm -hmm. I find so I think there is indi clear indication that there are mechanisms in place that become increasingly effective in addressing these problems of cartel-type cooperation of banks that is illegal. Um, I think that's clear that there are these negative effects. I, I don't think we can have a, we would have to have a separate day probably to discuss the financial and economic crisis and the role mm -hmm. of the banks in that. But what I think is clear is beyond the last 10 years of more or less crisis management and trying to put in place in Europe some institutional mechanisms for regulating the banking sector somewhat more effectively so that the state and societies cannot be um, held at ransom by banks because they are too big to fail and it would mm -hmm. lead to the, allegedly to the collapse of entire national or the European economy. I think that there have been regulatory changes in that direction, but I think there are bigger questions uh, which, of course, the Americans, for example, uh, had to address in the, uh, around the turn of the last century with the emergence of these big trusts in industry in mm -hmm. the United States. Is it not necessary to go beyond that and break up banks for minimally by dividing up the merchant bank side from the mm -hmm. banks that support small and medium-sized industries or have individual customers and so on? So these are bigger structural questions that I think are being discussed and where I would uh, certainly think that further more fundamental reforms are necessary so that we do not depend on this banking olig oligarchy that you've been talking mm -hmm. about. On the second question, uh, I, I entirely agree for, to begin with, of course, that the rise in voter turnout from 42 to 52 is entirely positive and does uh, also reflect a repoliticization <coughs> of European Union politics. So this permissive, this is called permissive consensus for very last time, that uh, for a very long time that existed in Western Europe into the 1980s, early 1990s, about the desirability of European integration as such but no one really took an actual interest in what was going on or knew anything very much about it, mm -hmm. was a pro going to be a problem in the long run if the European Union and actors in the European Union had an ambition to create a, a political system of kind, some form of transnational democracy. Because then you need politicization or repoliticization, if you like, in order to actually get citizens involved and feel that they have a stake in these processes. Mm -hmm. And you might well say that the uh, popular, or whatever you want to call them, populist political parties have played in this sense a positive role mm -hmm. in highlighting particular issues or problems that citizens feel strongly about. And this has facilitated this counter mobilization as well and affirmation of support for the European Union, which is also important. So I agree that there are positive elements to this, where I think there is a problem is that we are dealing with in the European Union naturally very complex issues, these issues of a transnational nature that have global ramifications and so on tend to be more complex than the question mm -hmm. of whether you want to put a new lantern here outside in front of the building, for example. So the more you go to a higher level of government or governance, the more complex it gets, the more difficult it is also for citizens to understand this complexity. And that's where the problem lies, I think, essentially with populist political parties that they then give very simple answers us to these very complex problems. And I think that's where uh, the danger lies, and I think Brexit is a wonderful example of that, because this claim that what we need is to uh, attain sovereignty again, become freed from these terrible chains of slavery in the European Union is a very odd and simplistic way of dealing with a far more complex set of problems. And I think once the UK has the hard Brexit, if the hard Brexit does happen, then I think many people will understand that the problem was much more complex than it was made seem by these populist leaders. And I think my last point would be that many of these populist leaders, of course, individually actually themselves belong to the elites that they criticize. Mm -hmm. So if you look at, again, the British context, if you look at Rees-Mogg, 
Johnson, Farage, these are all very wealthy people with uh, privileged uh, access to uh, pr privileged forms of higher education, education, school systems, uh, uh, private schools, etc., etc. They are all rich. They have all transferred large parts of their money outside of the country already. So they are demanding things at the expense of ordinary citizens and mobilizing these citizens against this assumed enemy in Brussels for their own personal interest, I think, of political progress and uh, becoming prime minister or uh, achieving Brexit or whatever it is. And that's, I think, where essentially we have a fundamental problem of people, individual citizens, being lied to by these populist leaders uh, who are not telling them the truth and who are also instrumentalizing these forms of dissatisfaction and fostering dissatisfaction for solely for their own individual purposes of career progression. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> evo odgovora na, na ova dva pitanja. Prvo, uh, što se tiče kartela, on podsjeća opet da je njegova ideja bila pre svega da ukaže na to kako su uh, ta bratstva, da tako kažem, ozbiljnih preduzetnika stvarila jednu vrstu kulture, kooperacije, koja je išla preko onoga što su bile u to doba dominante samo nacionalistički interesi i pokazuje da čak i za vreme rata su oni nalazili načine da funkcionišu. To je ono ko mi kad pričamo o tome kako mafije na ovim prostorima jako lepo sarađuju i za vreme rata, ako mogu da kažem na neki način. Međutim, vrlo brzo i to je ono 60-70 godine pokazuje loše strane to zapravo građanje oligopola na neki način i tu je kad zaista ulazi i priča o ordoliberalizmu, dakle to je antimonopolsko zakonodavstvo koje je Evropa posebno od 50-60. godina počela ozbiljno da usvaja i koje je u Nemačkoj do dan danas rahovito bitno i čuva sistem pluralizmu u toj zemlji. Dakle, što se tiče mog poređenja sa bankama, one su zaista uključeni bili u čitav niz ilegalnih praksi vrlo problematični, međutim, on opet podsjeća da je Evropska komisija otkrivala i suzbijala mnogi od tih praksi da pokušava da gradi mehanizme i zakonodavstvo kojim bi se protiv toga borila. I da je od toga, dakle, posle krize 2007. 8. 9. godine, otvoren taj krizni menadžment koji je zahtevao i uveo veću kontrolu banaka i sprečavanje ucena koje su ono, to je ona čuvena formulacija too big to fail, dakle previše velike da bi propali i da oni zapravo traže od države da, kako se kaže, socijalizuju njihove gubitke, a da kad je pitanje profita tu ne traže da se to raspodeli. Međutim, on smatra da je to zaista u Evropi među evropskom elitom i narodom nevezano i od populista, otvorilo one probleme sa kojima se Amerika suočavala krajem 19. veka kad su trastovi vladali i kad počinje se donose prvi antimonopolski i antitrust zakoni i on misli da danas postoji velika debata unutar Evropske unije da će se raditi na tome da se na neki način spreči ponovna situacija u kojoj bi banke mogli da ucenjuju ostatak sistema. Što se tiče odgovora na drugo pitanje, takođe se slaže da je ovaj razdel sača za 10% jako dobar, da se radi o kraju takozvanog permisivnog konsenzusa koji je postojao, dakle, gde je ogromna većina u Evropskom parlamentu stajala iza ideja da se podržava svaka vrsta evropske integracije, a zapravo niko nije znao šta se tu radi sve melite, da su ostali, što bi rekli, kogu uske umagli, sve to podržavali i da u tom smislu ova ponovna politizacija ili repolitizacija, na neki način redemokratizacija politike u Evropi jeste jedan značajan doprinos uključivanja i pokretanja ljudi, ne samo najviših elita, mobilisanja raznih slojeva i da to zaista jeste jedan značaj doprinost takozvanih populista u Evropi. Međutim, ono što njega tu brine jeste što njihov generalni, to je bar njegove teza, dakle, njihov generalni odnos prema složenim pitanjima jeste pokuš jedne instrumentalističke simplifikacije i usmeravanja na neke vrlo jednostavne i primanjive rešenja koja ne odgovaraju vrlo složenoj kompleksnoj stvarnosti koja postoji unutar Evropi i u pogledu odnosa Evrope sa drugim 
globalnim igračima u svetu i ne vidi se na celom tom prostoru, dakle, da se pokazuje spremnost za rešavanje, kako on kaže, složenih i kompleksnih pitanja i on opet vraća na ono gde živi, dakle, u Velikoj Britaniji, gde zaista jeste primer što ono ga pokazuje da ljudi koji su vodili Brexit ili oni koji se zalazu da kozani tvrdi Brexit, odnosno hard Brexit, poput Borisa Johnsona, Farage i tako dalje, jesu zaista deo vrlo bogate elite, ne ljudi koji su se demokratski narodni pobunjenici ili tribuni, da su to ljudi za koje postoje optužba da drži novac van države, dakle, i da celu ovu priču vode oko Bergzita na osnovu ličnog interesa i instrumentalizacije i da misle da to nije dobar način redemokratizacije, da tako kažemo, politike u Evropi. Anyway, I think that this is two hours exactly, uh, although we had the small audience, but you saw people who were coming mm -hmm. really interested in, in, in debating uh, about what is really going on, what you have uh, had the possibility to present us, and I really want to, to thank you very much for being with us today, sharing your thoughts and very active perception, which really means a lot to us. Uh, it's all taped here and it will be available through the internet. I hope that many other people will be able to join us as well. Ja sam se samo kratko zahvalio profesor Kajzeru, dakle, što je bio danas sa nama, iako nismo imali veliku kvantitativnu publiku, ali smo imali vrlo kvalitetne ljude u publicu koji su, kao što smo vidjeli, postavili vrlo informisane i vredne pitanja i zahvalio sam mu se zaista što nam je doneo, što bi rekli, u ovom trenutku najsvežije i tomačenja i dešavanja i pre svega pravce u kojima se razmišlja za rešavanje ovih problema u Evropskoj uniji u budućnosti. Thank you very much for coming. I've really enjoyed being here with you. Thank you. Hvala što ste bili i uživao sam što sam bio sa vama. Hvala.